Hello, welcome to today's session. My name is Matt Bichelle, Director of Product Marketing here at Airspike. It's my pleasure to moderate today's session. Airspike plus persistent memory equals voila. High density storage with PMEM on Airspike leads to significant CapEx OpEx reduction with Intel Optane DC persistent memory. Before I introduce our presenters, let me first encourage you to enter questions in the Q&A box where we'll field questions at the end. Also, slides will be available once the session goes on demand, which will be approximately one hour after we conclude. Our first presenter, Sai Devakutani, is Senior Director of Engineering, where his responsibilities include being the recent interim head of all data at PayPal Core, reporting to the CTO late last year. He's also responsible for one of the world's largest analytics and LLTP platforms with over 350 petabytes of data. The, he's also responsible for analytics platform, including technologies of Hadoop and Teradata, and the PayPal database as a service, privacy platform, and data access. So he has over 20 years experience in all things database, with 15 of them being at PayPal. Atharaya Gold Patrishna is Senior Engineering Manager at PayPal, where his responsibilities include NoSQL distributed databases, database automation software, and database lifecycle orchestration engines, fast storage solutions, including persistent memory, NVMe, and NVMe over fabric technologies, and database containerization technologies. Has over 17 years experience, so together, Today, we have two experienced industry veterans in the database space. So with that, I'll hand it over to Sai. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everybody. I hope every one of you is safe and healthy in light of ongoing COVID-19 crisis. It's great to connect us all virtually like this way, and I hope you get most out of this presentation. Uh, so this talk is primarily focused on, you know, how PayPal is leveraging, you know, the Intel opt-in memory and how we are running Aerospike at scale. You know, to get started at, you know, the scale at which PayPal is operating, here is a snapshot of database environment at PayPal. We have um, about 8 million plus executions per second across our database environment, right? This includes both SQL, RDBMS, and NoSQL combined together. We have about 4,000 database instances across our footprint. Uh, and we see about industry standard 32% database storage growth. I mean, that is typical. Uh, and, and we just, you know, we see the same growth. Some databases see more growth, some see less, but on an average, it's about that. And the overall, our OLTP, uh, the storage footprint, including all the copies, the disaster recovery instances, everything combined together, it's about 100 petabytes. And so, uh, the challenges that we see with, in general with this you know, is, like, you know, uh, um, do we keep our services for uh, The reliability becomes uh, an extremely important uh, the quality that we look forward to. <clears throat> performance is another thing. You know, as our data is growing, how do we keep the performance same while while the systems are scaling and the data is growing at the, at 32 percent a year over year? Right. So moving on to the next slide. So here you can see a, a sample of Aerospike clusters, you know, um, how the, you know, the overall executions per second, you know, how it is fluctuate. And one of the key advantages, uh, the key takeaway from this, from this slide here is that, you know, the burst of activity that suddenly surges from about 3.5 million executions per second to all the way closer to 7 million executions per second. All of this while ensuring that the performance stays consistent. And that is one of the key success criteria that we uh, used for evaluating Aerospike. Moving on to the next slide. So I also want to focus on why Aerospike at PayPal. Can everybody see the slide? Okay. All right, why Aerospike at PayPal? I mean, this is a question that we asked ourselves back in 2015 when we started doing POC on, on Aerospike. You know, prior to Aerospike, we were using another in-memory data store, and we are running into challenges in terms of, you know, the cost of scaling and, and the 99% 90, of performance is dropping off. So when we looked at it, you know, what is the success criteria that we can come up with? You know, one of the success criteria is to we, we're looking for a, a, a data store that is best of 
leveraging memory and the disks at the same time. You know, that can seamlessly leverage both uh, the memory and disks in such a way that it can guarantee a consistent performance. Right, that's number one criteria. The number two is the simplicity. Right, the scale um, <clears throat> obviously is the underpinning, underpinning of the requirements. So, and till today, you know, the thing that we are very proud of using Aerospike is is industry leading in leveraging the hybrid memory architecture. Now, I just talked about you know how the main memory and the SSD are being leveraged to their fullest advantage. And now with Intel Optane, you know, the, and it's, it's a very nice fit with the Aerospike architecture, right? That is one of the key reasons why we continue to use Aerospike at scale. Uh, the second one is, in fact, this is the, the most important one is the simplicity. You know, a lot of NoSQL technologies out there uh, that we see, like, you know, they try to do too many things. They try to be a generic database. And, and we see that, you know, um, you know, the, you know, the things start to, you know, not work as well as we would like at scale and keeping the consistent performance. You know, the simplicity ensures that, you know, you stay focused on the on the mission. You know, that's, again, key advantage. And the performance, we talked about it. You know, Aerospike is one of the few databases where the vendors themselves said, like, you know, hey, you know, they're pushing the limits of how much throughput you can get out of the SSD, how many IOPS that you can push out of the SSD, right? And that includes the NVMe, so. And the last one is the storage density, right? You know, uh, we use various other NoSQL technologies. Aerospike uh, definitely have gives us a better leverage in terms of how much storage we can have or node, and that enables us to be more efficient while uh, while keeping the cluster size to the minimal uh, the number of nodes. So with that, I will hand it over to Atreya. He's going to go deep into how we are leveraging the hybrid memory architecture. Thanks, Ai. Um, and I think we may have had a technical glitch. Um, so I'm going to just show the screen probably that we missed. Um, just a second. OK. Um, so this was the one that probably we uh, we were not able to share initially. Um, so we'll go back to the slides. So this was the, um, the overall spread um, in PayPal environment and uh, how many systems we uh, how, how many different technologies we uh, have within PayPal and how um, different scales of these systems um, are are being deployed. And Aerospike has about 2,000 servers uh, uh, in the current inventory. Uh, going, going to the uh, slide from where I'm going to start now. Um, so uh, with the introduction that I provided, um, uh, Aerospike does uh, have the highest number of uh, nodes. Uh, I think the F-16s are flying um, over my house today. There is a um, there is an activity going on. All right. Um, so coming back, uh, so we're showing showing here the evolution since 2010 uh, to 2015, how the storage density has evolved and what were uh, the technologies behind it. Uh, so most NoSQL databases were all in memory uh, for speed. Uh, so we leveraged uh, databases which were designed uh, to be in memory, uh, which were fast. Uh, but as we started uh, looking at uh, the future, it was pretty evident that we will not be able to sustain it. Um, uh, in 2012 or 2013, um, if I recall, uh, we were able to, we wanted to have 14 terabytes of storage and we needed whopping 600 servers uh, to store just 14 terabytes. And uh, the evolution shows here that 384 GB of RAM is what our standard was in 2012. And towards 2014, the databases evolved and uh, and then we were able to go to the density of about two terabytes per node. Um, and we didn't have Aerospec at that time. Uh, but in 2015 is when we um, when we started designing and, um, to, to make sure that we can continue to evolve and and still be if hello you can hear me okay perfect sorry for the technical glitch uh, think uh, okay perfect thank you um so the uh, the considerations were that uh, as we increase the density of storage uh, the rebalance and reindex time would 
uh, take longer and longer. Um, hence, we have to take a middle ground, uh, not to stretch too much into the density. Um, so in the previous slide, we looked at the, the SKU itself, which had four SSDs, but we actually implemented only two SSDs eventually. So the uh, idea was that we were wanted to design the solution to um, our the, the server to hold up to two billion keys with uh, uh, with as much uh, disk space uh, that we would want it to use, and um, based on that, uh, the uh, the design was to have 6.4 terabytes per node and up to 256 GB of RAM. So that uh, that got us to this queue, um, and uh, we were we started off with this queue. And all the way till 2020, our SKU did not change. Um, also, the way we design the systems today, um, uh, based on the uh, learnings from 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 all the you know 10 plus years of uh, designing the systems, uh, we came to a conclusion that a 20 node cluster would have been ideal size, uh, based on the probability of failures, based on the replication factor. And we design systems to only have replication factor of two. Uh, the reason being uh, the cost is the main consideration um, and resiliency is important. Uh, so we also have uh, multiple availability zones where we deploy multiple clusters. So we have a, a group of three clusters that are deployed in multiple uh, availability zones and uh, they are connected by XDR for replication. Um, taking that idea, uh, the consideration uh, by saying standardized uh, cluster sizes. So when we purchase systems, we purchase in uh, in quantities of 20 um, as a standard size. Uh, the cluster size could be smaller than that, um, but it actually helps us to keep consistency in how we design, how we build automations, how we do monitoring and all that. So that is the reason we do this standardized uh, design. Um, Um, then, so uh, the experience in 2015 was um, uh, prior to that, it was more like uh, putting together a tortilla um, by designing, um, you know, whatever the ingredients that were required. But then uh, the next thing was to, uh, once we put together Aerospike, it was a, a fluffy, fluffy um, cheese pizza, uh, though it was a personal uh, size. And um, then around the same time, uh, there was a announcement from a joint uh, announcement from Intel and Micron um, about persistent memory, 3DX point. Um, and it was very exciting to hear that because that is a new storage, uh, class of storage um, coming with uh, ex ex uh, extensive um, throughput plus also um, more importantly, the life of the SSDs were supposed to increase uh, considerably uh, because of the new designs. So that was very exciting, and uh, you know we always trying to bet on how would it come out as a, in what shape and form. We always knew SSDs would be the form factor uh, no matter what, but also there were many different opportunities where things can be embedded into um, a, a laptop or even the handheld devices. So all of those are possibilities and likely that will be coming in or if it's already there. Um, so that, that, that's something that we always expected. And um, only in 2019, um, in April, was the first announcement where um, it, it could be even before uh, this is something that we saw, uh, that it would be in the hands of end customers. Um, and then we contacted uh, all our vendors uh, uh, whom we work with, uh, these are OEMs, and um, and that that was happening all through uh, 2015 all the way till 2019 but in 2018 we got to know that the vendors would uh, the OEMs would get this into their hands and finally in april 2019 we got confirmation from the OEMs uh, saying the persistent memory modules would be available uh, then our next uh, thing was to take the pmem um, uh, devices and look at redesigning our SKU. Um, so we went ahead with designing that. And in this case, we, we could afford to increase the number of SSDs also to increase the density of the storage. 
so in this example, we have four 6.4 terabyte NVMe SSDs, and we have uh, a, a multiple PMEM modules. Uh, to, in totality, it's about a terabyte, nine, 996 here. Um, and there is an opportunity with PMEM coming in that we don't need as much memory anymore because the indexes, uh, in, in case of Aerospike, uh, will be stored on PMEM. Um, and the uh, and also that helps in reducing the cost of memory. Uh, it's only 192 GB of memory. Uh, and we wish we could go further down in terms of memory, but uh, that's kind of the standard design with uh, Cascade Lake um, uh, architecture. Yeah. Uh, so side by side, if we were to visualize this, um, our previous queue was Aerospike SD. Um, again, we cooked up a new name, uh, SD standard density because now we had a new new um, server with higher density, which we called as Aerospike HD. Um, and just as a, a analogy here, um, we, we have two glasses, uh, a smaller glass, uh, which can fit in uh, whatever, whatever water that we, uh, amount of um, volume that we can uh, pour in versus the second glass, which actually has much more higher density there, so we can pour more water into that. So we'll be using that um, the picture all around in other slides, coming slides. Um, so the, the first step was to do a comparison test uh, for ourselves to see, um, is this viable? Can we even move forward? So it, it was pretty encouraging to see that the performance, right performance uh, continued to be the same. We didn't see any uh, major differences. It was, although it was expected for writes, uh, we were we would have seen some kind of degradation if we were to do bulk loads, uh, wherein the writes are happening in in mass and the data is being written. Um, and because in PMM it is a file system, it actually writes it into a a file, and um, and hence it was expected. But uh, but with the load and the test that we ran, uh, we didn't really get to that levels. But um, the the, for the standard uh, throughput that we would generate on any given server in production, uh, this was un not noticeable. So this was a great encouraging uh, first step to get confidence. Uh, so write throughput was also in line with the uh, shared uh, shared memory um, performance profile. Uh, when it came to read re read performance and read throughput, um, it actually did even better. Um, and there are various different reasons for that. Um, but uh, the point was that it was, it was, we were so confident that uh, it was pretty easy for us to make a decision to do a bigger POC, not just a one node comparison test. Um, hence, we invested into um, buying uh, real servers uh, in, in, uh, in the beginning of, in, in June timeframe of last year, 2019. Uh, so with that, we got to a next stage where we're pretty confident that we can stretch uh, the personal pizza in, to be a large size pizza now. Um, now moving on. Okay. Um, a quick time check. So we should be able to um, get through this soon. All right, moving on. Uh, we we kind of tried rationalizing all the data points that we captured, and. Um, and uh, in the in the coming f uh, four months, uh, which we ran extensive amount of tests on um, with higher densities, and these densities were 25 billion keys in a 10 node cluster, and uh, 50 billion keys in the next round, in the third round, and 100 billion keys in the following round. Uh, so that gave us a complete view of what can what would it look like if we were to stretch. Um, uh, so the uh, the table here actually uh, shows what uh, what was the exact uh, let's see uh, what was the exact numbers side by side. Um, the screen here is a little small for me to read everything. Um, then I'm going to try that. Um, so max keys. Um, the most important points here were. Uh, let's go go back to the slide here. This is better. Uh, if we, if we were to load 50 billion keys, um, the uh, the stop time for stopping the database is 50 billion keys uh, would be about two minutes, um, and a warm start would be less than a minute, 0.6 minutes here. Uh, cold start would be an hour. Uh, incremental rebalance would be half an hour. Um, field rebalance would be about uh, nine hours. 
70 billion keys and 100 billion keys uh, following with that uh, it would be stop time uh, sorry uh, storage would be about 5 5 6 terabyte terabytes and 10 terabytes each uh, stop time would be 3 and 4 minutes each uh, warm start would be less than a minute and 1.2 minutes in the, um, in the second two uh, the other two ones and then cold start uh, would be again 2 hours and 3 hours uh, uh, the most important incremental rebalance uh, fill rebalance would be the, the longest one here. Uh, with about 70 billion keys, it would be um, closer to, I think, 16 hours. And then with uh, uh, with uh, 100 billion keys, that would take us 30, about 34 hours in total, which is a, 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 a day and a half almost. So that gave us a clean, uh, clear view of what we should do with uh, the SKUs. Uh, and also importantly, uh, with the premium included with a higher density, the cost would drop down to by 30%. In here, it's uh, you know we would I, you know in the in the past we would would have paid about 1.3 million uh, for about 60 servers. Now we would be uh, we would be in the range of uh, 0.9 million um, for about 30 servers, but uh, with the same amount of uh, data density. Um, and also we have an opportunity now to uh, to use uh, replication factor three because of higher density um, so and also the most important part here is the space and power savings that we get because of uh, 10 servers versus 20 servers and our standard design is to have three two four clusters um, sorry our standard design is to have two clusters uh, in a rack which is 20 servers each now with 10 server um, uh, cluster we could host up to four um, clusters within a rack. Um, okay, I forgot to mention this. Uh, the rolling upgrade and rolling software upgrade also had uh, significant improvisations that we could gain from here. Uh, it would take us uh, more than 10 hours to do a software rolling upgrade on a given cluster. Now it would be less than uh, five hours. Uh, with the OS, OS upgrade, um, we would be in the range of six hours instead of 10 plus hours. Um, and also, if you broadly look at the strategy, uh, we would be uh, able to host um, the same systems for an online, um, uh, online traffic, which when I say online, it is live traffic with very uh, stringent SLA for uh, detection of problems and recovery of the system. So we have very short SLAs. So in such in, in such cases, we would be still hosting 2x density of data on the on this type of SKUs. Versus if you go offline, which means there is no um, there is no such uh, stringent requirements for uh, detection and recovery, uh, we can host much more higher density. So the consideration was we would we would use different strategies for different environments, and hence uh, we should be able to manage. Um, and the cost, and uh, if you if you can take more risk, then we can reduce the cost considerably. So the cost reduction could be you know 60 60 percent or 50 plus percent at least uh, if we go with the 3x or 4x density. And if we can even give up the replication factor from three to two, uh, it's even better. So the um, in all of this, uh, the important fact is that we have a lot of levers that we can um, we can work with. Uh, we can uh, we can adjust our requirements and uh, and also we have uh, concepts like tiering of the databases which means if it uh, tier one would mean uh, uh, very um, uh, very strict SLA and uh, high performance and uh, all kinds of things attached uh, versus tier two and tier three could be of um, lower expectations so we could leverage uh, the higher densities there even more. And, and and in the analytics space, uh, there is always the growth of data because it's all human driven. Uh, the data we produce is what we consume as well. Um, so for that reason, we also need massive systems. Um, so it's it's, uh, uh, it's it's fantastic that we have these options in hand now that we can uh, move forward and implement uh, uh, large scale systems as well it's when it's required. Okay, um, now as we transitions, transition from uh, Aerospike SD SKU to Aerospike High Density SKU, uh, that also means, um, uh, you know, if we were to host 21 billion keys, 
uh, rad is one of our use case name um then we can actually host the same amount or even more uh, within a 10 node cluster even ha after having replication factor 3 uh with rep replication factor 2 uh, it becomes even more attractive which means we can host up to 40 billion keys within the same cluster uh and the most important one uh, which is a bigger gain which i mentioned in the previous uh, slide as well is um the time taken for for running a maintenance and os patching is is an ongoing activity um uh, and also db software upgrade that we do pretty frequently uh we have done at least um upgrades um maybe up to 18 or 19 times so far uh, starting from 3.7 version of aerospike to um, 4.5 the which is the latest and we are uh, getting to 4.8 very soon um and 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 this has helped us tremendously in our operational uh, um, uh, improvements and efficiency is what we've gained from all of this uh, now we can confidently tell uh with um with quiet feature in place uh with uh, delay fill migration in place uh, and with pmem in place uh, all of this put together as a package uh, is an amazing uh, experience now that we can do a lot of maintenance without needing to worry about um uh, system outage or or uh, or uh, impact to our availability of, to the business so where we stand today uh, with our inventory uh, we have about 2000 servers in total for a just aero spike uh, you know 60 plus racks on which they are hosted uh, 106 plus clusters um, and more coming um, and 200 aero spike high density servers that we recently have purchased and about 1800 servers which were from the past uh, from the standard density um, that's the in totality and uh, our current standard storage density is 24 terabytes per node um, and and uh, when we look back um, uh, which is 6.4 terabytes in 2015 that was the highest density uh, amongst all the nosql databases that we host today um which which was always al already a kind of a proud moment for us to say we are pretty efficient in storing data on the on aerospike um but now with uh, even higher density um the, it it only uh, adds up to the the pride that it was, that was already there um and and more importantly the te technological advancements um are actually helping in reducing the cost and keeping um the the um the economics in into uh, in in these equations to um, to help us to continue to move the business forward um and the more efficiencies we gain the better we can give it back to our customers and uh, one other last thing that i wanted to highlight here is um we actually are uh, did choose a lower density uh, in the slide if i show 2015 6.4 terabytes the reason being uh, as i mentioned if we were not to do that if we did go with higher density at that point we probably would have had several operational issues we could not have done uh, 18 to 19 rounds of upgrades that we went through uh including os patching or including uh, db so software upgrades um and with with persistent memory coming into picture uh, we we can now confidently say we can go further higher density so that's the um take away here that um and the technological advance, advancements are uh, getting us to be more operationally mature uh, while also reducing the cost Okay so the whole journey looked like this uh, we started off with uh, preparing a uh, tortilla and then uh, quickly um, migrating into um a personal pizza size and then improvising it further to a large size pizza and finally applying all the toppings on it to make a gourmet pizza out of this so uh, that is the reason we uh, chose to have our title as uh, aerospike plus uh, persistent memory um the total equation um with which they come with uh, uh with their ad advantages uh, makes us feel to say voila this was a amazing uh recipe uh, together and uh, and hats off to everyone who is involved in making these things happen
Thank you. Um, and stay safe. Uh, we'll take some questions from here. OK, great. Uh, yeah, this is Matt again. Um, so again, everyone, feel free to uh, log your questions into the Q&A box. Um, I think there were some earlier questions that you may have uh, answered. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, Sai and or Athreya, if you could just go over again, how many AeroSpike nodes uh, and clusters uh, are you guys operating currently? Um, sorry, uh, Sai, you want to take it or you want me to? Okay. Go ahead, Athreya. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so we have 2,000 servers today that we host, uh, Aerospike on. Uh, they're distributed in multiple data centers and uh, different availability zones within the data center. Um, we also logically construct them into different size of clusters, uh, the max being 20 nodes uh, in an online uh, environment. And in an offline environment, we have up to 48 node clusters. Um, and the total, in total, uh, it's about 107 uh, clusters. And uh, they're, they're all part of different groups. Uh, so you can say um, in some of these clusters don't have um, multiple deployments, they're single, singleton deployments versus uh, majority of our online systems, they're all deployed in, in a group of three clusters. So uh, when I say cluster, these are independent clusters, but they, they could be grouped together into a cluster group by means of XDF. Got it, got it. And I, are they uh, deploying different applications? You mentioned an RADD uh, internal, I guess is the code name of the application. Are they all are they all operating different applications? Yeah, so they, they, we do have uh, varieties of different applications uh, all in the FART space and, um, and, and beyond FART space, there are many others as well, uh, which are smaller in nature. Um, uh, but broadly, if we were to categorize them, um, they, they, they are key value uh, solutions and broadly the um, uh, uh, fraud analytics that requires um, tiny key values to make comparisons on um, what does this profile of this user look like? Uh, could be one of those examples. Other examples are we do have variables that we create uh, that, that actually keeps account of um, uh, the occurrences of events that we recognize could be a fraudulent or not. Um, so those type of counters are also kept in the system. Uh, there is also improvised solutions like uh, graph that we build and maintain um, uh, in, inside of Aerospike uh, as key values. And then there are solutions built on top of it uh, that, um, that could glue them together to make it as a graph. Uh, so we do have graph use cases extensively deployed as well. Very good, very good. Um, um, one attendee uh, indicated or is requesting, could you, uh, why does PayPal get better density with PMEM versus without it? Sure. Um, the reason is um, we, we could, uh, I'm not sure if I can probably go back to the screen here. Um, we, we could have in 2015 when we were sharing the story and the journey, uh, we could have actually um, deployed at 12 terabytes or even more per node. Um, but that also meant higher, uh, the longer time for re-indexing and rebalancing. And, and that is something that we didn't want uh, ourselves to be exposed because we always wanted to store two copies within a cluster uh, for, for cost benefits. Uh, that means we only have redundancy of one node. So if we were to take a node out and if a rebalance starts, and if that rebalance goes for, um, let's say, 20 hours with uh, with a 12 terabyte density storage, um, and at back then there was no fill uh, uh, fill rebalance or delay fill rebalance configuration available either in your spike, um, it was um, we were not confident that um, we can sustain that because if if during that process if a second node uh, is lost, then it's it's a uh, it's a scenario of data uh, data loss as well not a permanent loss, but it's unavailable during the time. So that was uh, the danger that we would have run with. So we kept the no, uh, uh, the density low, the rebalances, 
uh, as fast as possible. And another important point is, uh, if we were to uh, do an OS patching on the system with high density, uh, on top of rebalance, there is also reindexing time that gets added up. And uh, with the, with um, with a larger density, uh, our, our tests already showed us that if we were to, you know, if we were to have a 512 GB of RAM and uh, 12 terabytes of SSD and fill it up with as many indexes as we can, uh, that would take us to probably around six or eight billion keys per node. Uh, but if we did that, um, then the time for reindexing would be two hours or three hours on top of rebalance. So imagine rebalance taking 15, 16 hours, and then on top of that, we spend another four hours. So that would be very long. And we, in the meanwhile, the next node, if it goes out, and if we lose data or if we miss the data, uh, that's going to be a serious problem. So hence, it was a conscious decision to go with fluid density. Yeah, make, make yourself faster, uh, minimize that window. Uh, we had a couple questions regarding warm restarts. Um, and we may go a little bit over time. Um, do we, uh, what are, did you see any data issues with warm restarts using PMEM? Uh, did we, uh, sorry, I wanted to um, ask the question again. So did we see uh, what issues with the warm restart? Yeah. Data issues. Data issues. Um, that's interesting. So the, the, the PMEM is no different than uh, uh, you know, memory in terms of how we look at it, other than saying uh, it, it's it, because it's a device by itself, you can actually see uh, the the uh, index files getting created on PMM device. Um, so we, we didn't, I mean, there is no reason to think that there should be an issue. Um, if at all one of the DIMMs fail, uh, then the entire system will be out uh, and, and the recovery has to happen with the rebalance uh, happening from other nodes. So uh, I, in, in real time, there is no reason to think that there should be any corruption or a failure or missing data or anything like that. But in case of a, a DIM failing, a PMM DIM failing, then the only option at that time would be to wipe out the DIMs, um, wipe out the uh, files on the DIMs after the uh, PMMs are recovered, and then let the database start start again, which will be a cold start and the indexes will be uh, created again on the PMEM device. Now, if we do have a combination of failure with PMEM as well as SSD failing, then we pretty much empty the node, uh, which means empty the SSDs, uh, empty the PMEM uh, uh, file system, and then bring back the node, and the full rebalance should take care of repopulating all the data with the indexes and, and the data itself. Great. Um, so I think you've covered uh, a lot of the questions on warm restart. Um, an another question may be about, you alluded to uh, quote unquote, massive systems moving forward. I assume that's multiple petabytes in scale. Uh, it seemed to be in regards to uh, offline analytics. Is that something that is currently underway or is that already uh, existing with uh, yeah, so good, good question. So most of our use cases are divided between offline and online uh, from the beginning. Uh, the the same use case will be on online as well, while it's also offline. Uh, so there is there are a bunch of such examples. For example, graph. We do prepare data offline. So I'm showing this uh, screen again um, because the question came up on warm restart and whatnot. Um, uh, so the use cases are split between the two. Um, hence, all the things that we have been discussing, uh, most use cases do exist on both environments. Uh, but majority is online. Uh, few of the use cases also is, are replicated into offline. Uh, but they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, it's an overlap. Of the same use cases are deployed in both places. And in some cases, more online and not, not even on offline. Um, we have uh, a quick question, uh, another technical question, or technology question even, is does the speed and latency of the SSD affect the amount of PMEM that's needed? Um, the, 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 the relationship with PMEM to SSDs um, are, are 
not necessarily and um, uh, they 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 actually define the overall performance of the system uh, so pmm doesn't come with multiple speeds but ssd does come with multiple speeds so the same nvme is that we we go after we can have multiple uh, speeds on the nvme ratings um, now if we were to swap out nvme with the sata or a sas ssd um, the overall system will slow down while pmms will be fast enough to do indexing reindexing and traversal um the storage um of uh, the storage device that we use uh, which will be the ssds that will define the final outcome of the en entire transaction performance uh, so there is no direct correlation with one the other because pmms comes with its own speed and ssds come with its own speed now if if both of these systems are um, and let's say pmm you you won't have an option to change the speeds because it is it's a mem you know it's a device uh, that we can purchase i don't know if there are different variations in the um uh, in the frequency uh, that is available uh, i haven't seen that uh, but imagine keep that as static and you know if you work with ssd speeds then the overall performance of the system will be more dictated by the ssds and not necessarily the pmm um so i hope i answered that question okay um, there's a follow-up question clarifying the offline storage um, uh, question just before. Uh, it seemed that you, the quote unquote, the question reads, it seemed you're using AirSpike cluster as offline storage too. Is that true? Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question well. Um, I, would, I would rather probably ask, uh, uh, if I understood uh, well, so when we say offline storage, I'm not sure uh, what that meant. I think so the way I understood the uh, understood the question is: is Aerospike be, being used as a storage solution? No, the answer is no. Uh, the offline use cases meaning like you know we need to store high density of data while also processing the data through Aerospike, right? I mean we are getting better density while sacrificing some level of reliability. And that's what we meant by high density aerospace clusters for offline use cases. That is not replacing right. offline storage solution, which is like an object storage. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and these are active systems. That means they'll be used under Spark. They'll be used for analytics, uh, execution engines. Um, so they're, they're no different than you know database being used for anything else. So it's, it's as, uh, the same set of use cases, uh, but offline versus online is more of our terminology to uh, to mention that they're taking uh, live traffic from PayPal transactions versus an offline transaction that can, can be generated by an analytics job that is trying to generate um, uh, some kind of analytical simulation that we want to run. Uh, and hence the SLS could be different and we can play with that in terms of uh, designing the system. Okay, very good. Well, I think that is our last official question. We've uh, certainly eaten up into the break time, but I think people uh, that sit on it thought it was well worth it. I did want to make an announcement for those that have not joined the AirSpike Slack channel for the event. Uh, you can do so or make a request to do so at tinyurl excuse me again, tinyurl.com slash join dash aerospike dash slack. And at 2.30, we're having a virtual happy hour there. Um, again, the materials will be available on demand and the session will be on demand. You can also answer your questions if you're listening on demand and they'll be routed to Sai and Athreya via email. So again, a big uh, thank you uh, from the entire aerospike community to both Sai and Athreya. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure. Um, and also stay safe. Uh, we have a topic coming up tomorrow uh, from, from PayPal team as well on how do we manage this infrastructure. Um, so if you can join, that should be a great story as well. Sai, back to you. All right, thank you.